And now, from beyond our dimension, this is the Jeff Mara Podcast. Here's Jeff. My guest is Vincent Jenna, author, psychic therapist, medium, spiritual teacher, and mystic healer who has been helping people transform their lives through his psychic reading for nearly four decades. Over the last several years, he has been communicating with the Intergalactic Council of Extraterrestrial Beings who contacted him to help share the truth about UFO and aliens, which we are going to talk about and more. Vincent, thank you so much for being my guest today and welcome. Oh my God, Jeff, thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. I guess most people are born psychic and probably most of us don't know how to use our powers, but you've been able to take the powers to the next level. How did you do oh. that? <laughs> I love the way you, it, it, I wish it was as smooth as you just said that. That sounded so great. Um, well, we're all intuitive. Every single human is intuitive and intuition and psychic ability is the same thing. So every time somebody says, I'm listening to my gut feeling, guess what, people? You're being psychic. That's exactly what being psychic is. Well, what happened to me, Jim, is it was, it was thrust upon me. I was not expecting this. I was a professional singer, actor, and dancer when I was younger. And so it was now after I, I was in the movie Grease, as a singer and dancer, right? And and we know the you know the fame that 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 just movie just exploded and it became a blockbuster overnight. That happened at the same time as my 10 year high school reunion. And I was the one that was bullied in school. I was tormented all the time. I was chased home. If the kids caught me, they'd beat me up. I was shoved in lockers, my head flushed in toilets, thrown in dumpsters, stripped and thrown in, in, in assemblies in order to be embarrassed. I, I mean, it was a nightmare during that time. But there was one kid who was really the instigator of all of it. He was the class clown and the super jock. So you put those two together and he was loved by everybody in the school, right? So all he had to do is say my name and boom, that gave everybody, including the jocks, permission to antagonize me and pick on me. Well, at our 10 year high school reunion, you know, everybody started growing up, thank goodness. And he wound up befriending me and we became really close. So the guy who was my enemy wound up becoming a really dear friend of mine and his life was falling apart but he wouldn't say it to anybody. I just knew it. In hindsight, I guess it was that my psychic ability was waking up already, but I didn't know that yet, right? Didn't know that. And so we spent a lot of time together and I just knew, I kept hearing every time he talked about his successful job and his loving wife, who was his childhood sweetheart and three children. And, you know, he lived in a beautiful condo in Connecticut in an expensive area. I just kept hearing BS, BS, BS. And one weekend after spending a weekend with him, my wife and I were over his place. His wife wasn't there. She was away with the kids. I was like, no, I was feeling terrible. And the entire time, he, this was the guy, I could love him, but all he did was talk about himself. You know, he also rented a Porsche to go to the high school reunion. You know that kid who wants to impress everybody, right? And I'm driving home with my wife and I'm hysterical crying, really. I mean, I'm sobbing because my heart is breaking for him. And my wife is, what is wrong with you? And I'm like, I just know that this guy's life is falling apart. I just know it. And she's like, no, he's living in a beautiful condo in Connecticut. And we're renting a house on Long Island in Levittown where you grew up. And I was like, ah, no, that's, that something's wrong. And so I cried out to God for the first time in my life. I never prayed to God to help me while I was being tormented, but I did now, but I was asking God to help me help him. I didn't ask God to help my friend. I asked God to help me help him and people like him. I knew what it was like, you know, Jeff, to have your ego and esteem torn away from you. And so I asked for the ability, give me the ability, give me something, give me some tools. I don't know what. Well, you know, the old adage is watch what you ask for. 
And within a week's time, you know, Cecil B. DeMille, who is an old Steven Spielberg, if you put them together, they still couldn't create the epic movie that happened to my life at that point. I'm talking all paranormal and supernatural stuff started to happen. Psychics were coming into my life and then spirits at my house that I was starting to see and hear. And then I'm reading minds and then I'm seeing the past, present and the future. And all this information is flooding through me. And I started trancing a voice of my spirit guide is coming out of me. At least that's what he said. He was my spirit guide. So all of this unbelievable stuff was happening. My wife didn't know whether to call the local rabbi, the local priest to have me exercised or Bellevue to have me locked up. But thank goodness she had been with me since I was 17 years old. So she knew I didn't know any of this stuff. And the information that was coming out was very positive and very psychic. And so with belief and with, you know, I, I pushed against this. But we were guided to the right places. We were guided to the right people and the information. And everything led up to who I am today now. And so it wasn't a matter of just discovering I was psychic. It was a matter of a floodgate opening and pounding me with it. So that's the abridged version. If you had more time, I would tell you the unabridged version. You must have been feeling like you're losing it. How did you hold it together? You want to know what bothered me the most, Jeff? This is what's funny. First of all, I was an odd guy to start with from the very beginning. Very, you know, I was extremely talented as a little kid. I could sing, act, and dance from a very young age, you know? So I did all performing. So th there was an oddity to me to start with. I wasn't concerned that something was wrong with me mentally. I was more upset that I was being told I was going to be a spiritual teacher and not that I was going to win an Academy Award and Emmy and a Tony. That's what I wanted to know. If that psychic comes into my house, tell me that. They're telling me I'm going to be a spiritual teacher. I had more <laughs> about that than I did about being a psychic. I didn't even know from a psychic or a medium. I'm like, all right, you see him on TV. I heard about it and stuff like that, but why the heck me? And it actually, I was watching Oprah Winfrey one day. I was home watching my kid and my wife went to work in Manhattan at the time. We were living on Long Island because I was pursuing an acting career. So of course I was home most of my life, <laughs> um, right? So I'm watching Oprah and Shirley MacLaine is on. And Shirley MacLaine comes out of the spiritual closet on Oprah to talk about the book she wrote out on a limb and how all of this psychic and, and unbelievable stuff, paranormal stuff was happening to her. And I'm like, wait a minute, that's what was happening to me. Are you kidding me? And this happened to Shirley MacLaine? You mean I'm not abnormal? This is, this is, wow. But why? But Shirley MacLaine's a star. Why me? And so she normalized it for me. And I'm waiting to meet Oprah so that I could thank her. And I would love to meet Shirley MacLaine, too, to thank her, too. But yes, they normalized it for me. So, no, I didn't feel like I was crazy, but I was still upset that I was going to get an Academy Award. <laughs> Vincent, I'm really big on definitions and this may seem really simplistic but can you tell us the difference between a psychic a medium and a channeler oh that i'll throw in a fourth one channeling and trancing and psychic and medium mm -hmm. uh, they're considered four different aspects okay very simple jeff and that's not a simplistic question that's an important question because most people want to know the difference a psychic is capable of telling linear time, the past, the present, the future. So very linear. We go into those dimensions. Every single being is connected to a, a dimension of information. Actually, Carl Jung, who was Sigmund Freud's best student, called that place the collective unconscious mind or the mind of God. And so we all reside there. So therefore, all pieces of information about every single person is in that dimension. Well, we like to look at time linear, but in actuality, time is a location. And that was just out in the New York Times 
newspaper, they put an article about that. Scientists said that time is not straight across the line. It's a place, and they all are happening at the same time. They're above each other, shall we say. So a psychic taps into those dimensions, whether you want to look at it this way or whether you want to look at it this way. A medium now goes beyond those dimensions to the spiritual or heavenly dimensions. And the heavenly dimensions are where we all go after we let go of our human form and bodies. And the interesting thing is, you know that tunnel of light that a lot of the, well, actually, most of the near-death experience people that I know and books I've read about all experience the same thing and will see a tunnel of light or some form of light with loved ones or people or guides at the other end. Well, that is like a an express train, shall we say. An express train that goes from the earth location to the heavenly location and it bypasses all the other dimensions, the earthly dimensions, until it gets to the heavenly dimensions. And then there's more dimensions after that. So a medium is able to now tap in and not talk about the past, present, and the future, but actually connect to other spirits who had incarnations here. Sometimes some mediums can actually talk with angels, but those who have had incarnations here, deceased loved ones, or even ones that you didn't love so much, and actually communicate with them, their energy form in that dimension. Now, channeling, channeling is where you get out of your way and you're able to bypass your conscious thinking mind and actually connect to your soul's mind, which is far deeper inside of you. I actually explain this part in my new book, which we'll, we'll talk about. But when you're channeling, you're actually allowing the higher part of you to communicate and to talk through you. You see, there is a difference between thinking talk and channeling talk. Other people call it in the zone. Like you go to a corporate, you know, um, convention and you got a lot of speakers there or even a spiritual um, event, a summit and the speakers, they tend to get into zones while they're speaking. I know I do. And the information just pours through them. Some people say, oh, that spirit speaking through me. Some people, they like to, you know, they always like to make things more than what they really are just to mystify it. And if you mystify something too much, it misses the mainstream people. And that's the problem. It, it's so simple. It's called being in the zone. When you're in the zone, man, things are just right with you, right? You know it yourself. When you're talking with a guest and you're hearing them, you know exactly when they're in the zone. My wife can tell me when I'm doing an event, um, yeah, most of the time you were in the zone. The other couple of times it was you thinking. But it was okay because even thinking, you still have the information, but you can always tell when you're in the zone. So that's channeling. Now, trance channeling over in the UK, and they like to dis to dis Distinguish it here differently as well. Trans channeling is the concept that you are allowing now another spirit to enter you, use your physical body, your vocal cords to speak. And so you've got another spirit speaking through you. I've got a secret to tell all of you. Come closer, listen. <laughs> that's not what's happening. Everybody would like to believe that's happening because again, it's mystical. And you want to listen to that information like Abraham Hicks. Oh goodness. You want to definitely listen to Abraham, right? Edgar Casey's channeling, trans channeling actually said it the best. He never defined and it never defined who or what it was. It was another part of Edgar Casey, an accumulative part of Edgar Casey. In actuality, it was Edgar Casey's higher soul. There are not beings entering people's bodies. That's just not the way it's done. 
if if there was, then we would be losing our free will. Now, wouldn't we? Wouldn't it be easy for a spirit? Let's say Jesus, for goodness sakes, let Jesus enter somebody and start talking. And, you know, there's been some people who claim that he is right. Um, some of you born again Christians, what do they do? They speak in tongue and they speak in tongue purposely because it's the idea that there's another spirit that's speaking through them. It's all to impress you. But here's the problem with that, Jeff. It doesn't solve a thing on this earth. It doesn't change people's way of creating their life. As a matter of fact, it pushes you even further away from the understanding that you are connected to a higher source. You are your own channeler. If there's great information coming through you, it's because of you. You're opening up to it. You're allowing it to come. Yes, we can get guidance. Just the same as outside people or friends or your loved ones turn around and say, hey, listen, don't go down that block there. That's not really a good idea to go down that block today. All right, I'll go down the other block. But you don't have that person attached to you or inside of you and making the choices, the decisions and speaking for you. Some people do that, but in the psychology field, we call that symbiotic relationship and it's a disorder. So no spirit, no angel is going to speak through you. No alien, oh boy, I mean, talk about bashing everybody who's out there. No aliens going to speak through you either. They'll speak to you like I speak to them. But if you're of a spiritual nature, you would never do that because you would be taking away a person's and an audience's free will to choose to believe and make their own choices. That's the difference between all of them. I had to throw in the thing. If I was going to define what a trance is, I needed to define what my belief about that is all about. You know what I mean, Jeff? Mm -hmm. Sorry to take up that much time. No, that was amazing. From what you're saying, in, in my understanding, they're connecting in some really deep, higher part of themselves. Is it possible that they're confused, that they think they're talking to an alien or an angel, but they're really still talking to a, a different part of their higher self? I'll say this. I don't think they truly intend to sit there and want to mislead you. But their need to be prophetic, their need to be famous, their need to look, I had my higher self, okay? I Joseph from Canaan, very major character in the Bible, okay? Um, he's also the musical Joseph and the Amazing Technicolor Dreamcoat. All right, he's my higher guide. When this all happened to me, um, that's the one who is coming to me and giving me a whole bunch of information about who I was. And I actually sat with just my wife and two of my friends. We did it together and we allowed Joseph to speak through me, which in actuality, I was still there. I was in a very, very meditative state, man. I was, talk about zoned out. I don't even remember what I say, but I know I'm doing the talking. And so Joseph is speaking to me and I'm basically saying what Joseph is wanting me to say, but that's all, that is that is it. That is the highest part. He is not speaking through me. He's not taking over my body. He's just talking to me and I'm speaking for him and we're both speaking together. And he's part of my higher conscious mind. And in actuality, um, I've been told that Joseph is one of my incarnations. Okay, well, whether he is, whether he isn't, whether he's a branch of mine and connected to me in some way, it's still me who is allowing it, and it's still me who is directing it. And so I did that alone. Now, that was before Abraham. And that was after the time period of, you know, Seth Speaks. There was Seth Speaks. There was Ruth Montgomery and her person that trans channeled through. And of course, Edgar Casey. All of those people became really well known because mysticism attracts people. Why? because everybody is bored with life and doesn't know how to create the lives they want. So they're constantly looking for something bigger and better.
And now it's gone beyond the earthly plane. I can speak and have this special spirit come through me to give you information. And now everybody is drawn to that because they think they're going to get something bigger, deeper, better. Mm. And I can understand that. So it's not that they intentionally manipulate. And I'll tell people right away, I know that it's part me and Joseph combined together that speaking right now. I will tell you, I am not misleading you. This is not a Joseph speaking all by himself, okay? This is not Bouchard. This is not, um, you know, Esther Hicks. Now, those people came out with the most unbelievable information. But here, I ask you this. If Esther Hicks and Jerry just put out their own information without Abraham at all, would they be as famous? It's a good point. So it gets the point through, but now everybody's looking at them going, oh, I wish I could do that. I wish that happened to me. And then some people are even convincing themselves that things like that have happened. You know, you got people walking around every single day in my field telling me that their angels are talking to them. Oh, the only reason why I did that is my angels told me to do that. Oh, okay, I did that today, my angels. You know that my angels spoke with your angels and told me to tell you. And I'm like, oh my God, do you understand you're not going anywhere in life? Your angels would not do that. They're not controlling. They will just give you little pieces of guidance and then even make you forget that it came from them. It has to be your choice. And so all of these other people are, are picking up from those famous people and trying to establish and create the, the same thing. And you know what they all are? They're those people who audition for American Idol thinking they are God's gift to the singing world and they can't even carry a tune. What about those people? Why do they believe that they are so good. And that's not all put on. There are people in the world absolutely who believe they're that talented. There are people in my field, Jeff, who think they're God's gift to the psychic world and they're hurting people. Why do they do that? Why do they need that? Because they need to believe so much in how great they are and how special that they are. They will latch on to what they see being successful in the world. So the things we made as successes are actually hurting people. Mm, wow. Let me ask you this. You're a medium, and from what I understand, when you are doing mediumship, you're communicating with people, and you called it the upper dimensions, or I'm guessing it's the sixth or seventh, eighth dimension. I can't remember what the word you use. But what about if there are spirits around which we may call ghosts? Do those exist, and are those spirits that are wandering around here in the third dimension with us, unseen? And do okay. you connect with those people? Great question. I am... I do ghost healing. I don't do ghost busting. I do ghost healing. All right. Our third dimension, just so that you know, is our physical plane. Yours, mine, our spouses, all the people here. That's it. Those are the, That's all that can live in this plane. It's physical. That's what the third dimension is about. The first dimension is just, just is flat. And the second dimension now has image like drawings and everything you read. Um, what you're looking at on the internet right now, the monitor, that's flat, but it still has shape. That's the second dimension. The third dimension is when it actually takes physical form. All right. Remember that express train I talked about when you first die and you go to those heavenly dimensions? Well, if you don't get on that express train and you no longer have a body, you are stuck in the earthly dimensions. And maybe the earthly dimensions are four, five, six, seven. You, you know that the concept of ascending to the fifth dimension? Right. You don't want to ascend to the fifth dimension. You'd be trapped with all the other ghosts. There is no such thing as ascend. That's another thing. There's no such thing as ascending to the fifth dimension, okay? That's a consciousness understanding, not a place to go. So, yes, there are ghosts. If you've had a completely tragic death, if you are a very negative person, a lot of criminals, 
um, people who commit hard atrocities to people on earth, um, and even children that have gotten caught up in uh, catastrophes and wars and stuff like that, they don't necessarily go through that light. That's the tunnel of light is that express train. They fear the light. They fear moving past their body and they don't understand it, right? Um, what do you hear some of the NDE people describe when they're in their experience and they're hovering over their bodies? There's a certain, even though they can feel like Eben Alexander um, uh, felt and Anita Morgiani, famous stories, they felt this incredible incredible peace. They didn't feel any pain, but there was still this unknowing and some even a fear. What's happening? Where am I? Right. And so that happens with all of us. Well, can you imagine now one that doesn't go through the light or is afraid of the light and then get stuck here? They develop that frustration and that anger and that resentment. As a matter of fact, almost every culture and every religion has some form of praying for the dead. In Catholicism, if you stole, lied, cheated, and then you died, those were venial sins. And so you would get stuck in purgatory. And of course, if you murdered somebody and you committed one of those bad, 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 bad sins, you go to hell. Where is purgatory? They weren't telling you what purgatory was, but what purgatory was, and they were trying to scare the hell out of you to keep you from getting stuck here. So only do good things, only do good things. So it wasn't just a matter of controlling you. It was a matter of trying to protect you and overprotect you. Don't We don't know what gets you caught in the ghostly planes, but boy, do we know that there are ghosts around, but we're not going to call them ghosts. We're going to use that. We're going to call it purgatory, and we're going to scare you into doing good. And that's what they did. But other cultures, you've got Todos Santos, you know, um, a Day of the Dead we're in Mexico and in Spain, they have theirs. And in other cultures where you prayed for the dead so that they don't come back and haunt you. Now, some of their belief is that even grandma and grandpa, if they even crossed over, they could still come back and, and haunt you. But it's not them that would do any of the haunting. It would only be the ghost here. Misery enjoys company. And so, yes, so what I did is because of my mediumship ability, I can also see ghosts. And I, I went around the country. People brought me around the country to some of the most haunted places, and I would heal them. I would connect with the ghost and try to move them on because they are stuck here. But here's the thing. They're still our brothers and sisters. And you know the saying that came about um, basically during Obama's time, President Obama in the United States, who said no child left behind, and they started that program. Well, that actually is an inspiration from something we know as souls. No soul left behind. We won't leave behind our brothers and sisters, whether they're stuck, whether they're bad. Eventually, we're all going to have to help each other so that we can all go home together. And so that's why I want to help heal them. It's not just an entertainment thing that I want to do. Like there's there's definitely the Ghostbusters and the, the paranormal to prove the ghost there. I can tell you in a moment if a ghost is there, I have a conversation with them. They come up to me right away and I start talking. I can describe them and I'm never wrong. I can describe them. They tell me their history and then the psychic part kicks in and I can do a reading on them. And, and so what I then do is I ask for the light to be brought down and I can, and everybody can do that. That's what praying does actually. And it brings the light down and you cross them over and into it. So yes, of course there's ghosts. In doing my research of you, I found out that you were a social worker for hospice. Ah. During that work, did you ever have a shared death experience with anybody or anything like that? Well, you see, during that entire time, I what I did, just to preface that real, I'll keep this short, believe me, it as a psychic, I actually did not like the field of being a psychic or being called a psychic because of the label that went with it and, and the kind of con concepts that went along with psychics. We're loony people from California or something like that. 
So what I did, and because I dive into the mind so much, I went back to school to get my BA in psychology and my master's in clinical social work. So I knew the human mind up, down, inside out and everything as long as I was in there and developmental stages. So part of the work that I did is I had my own practice. I was a psychotherapist and eventually I wound up working as a hospice clinical social worker. I figured the best way to find out how to live Jeff is to see how we die. And the one major thing that I did learn, and this is for everybody, and it may sound scary, but you can control it. You will die the way you live. You will die the way you live. If you live negatively, if you live in fear, you will die negatively. If you live in peace and positive, you will have a positive passing. And in that, I have been and able to help all, well, I was there for the majority. I held, let me see, over 500 people I, I had as patients. And of course, there I, I supported their caregivers and their loved ones. But I would say that 50% of them, I actually saw their souls leave their bodies. And their soul leaves the body before the body actually dies. Hmm which is interesting because, and what I hear from those on the other side and what I've been told spiritually is that there is no reason for the soul to go through the suffering or to go through some of the hurting. So when you hear people instantaneously dying in accidents and all of these, it really is hard for me to think of the pain and the horror that some people go through with some of these deaths, right? When in actuality, your soul will jump out of your body before it experiences any of that. Think of this for a moment with and, and go back into the past and history and just think of some of the, I mean, earthquakes and volcanoes, some of the horrible ways that people died even today, but horrible ways that people died. Do you think the soul would keep coming back lifetime after lifetime having experienced stuff like that. Even a woman has special hormones in her body that make her forget the pain of pregnancy purposely mm -hmm. because women would never have another child. There would not be 8 billion people on the face of the earth, which might be a good thing if there weren't, but we wouldn't have the, we wouldn't be 11,000 years old as a species if women remembered the pain that they went through every time they had a baby. So it's the same thing with the souls. We don't remember the pain because we don't always experience the pain. Now, some souls may choose to, so you will jump out. So I have seen, and I was able to tell the, the loved ones, He's gone. Your mother's gone now. And they would look at the body and say, it looks like a shell. It, that, that's because she left. I've seen them left, leave. I've actually helped them to leave. And a few of mine, not all of them, of course, but a few of my patients came back to me in spirit to tell me to say thank you to say, thank you, you helped me. And they wanted to thank me. And they never needed to because they had their own things and their own family to take care of and to be evolving continuously without thinking about me. But yes, some people came back and I saw actually their spirits leave. And, and when I'm seeing it leave, there have been some of the caregivers that will, wait, what is that? It's like a some smoke just came out of my mother or just, and it's very interesting. And we all leave, guess where? through the heart, not through the head, through the heart. The heart is the last thing to beat. When that heart stops, that's why they pronounce death the moment the heart stops beating. Even if there's signals that could be still passing in the brain, and that's what some doctors want to consider near-death experiences are, is that you're still getting the mm -mm 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 -mm. because you can't control those, those sparks that are going in your brain. So why on earth would you see a loved one? 
Why on what, a memory that is coming to you and holding out your hand? So that entire story that you're creating are just random sparks shooting in your head? No, of course not. Just like dreams, you can't make a specific dream happen, not unless your brain wants to get a message to you, your soul, your unconscious mind. So they don't still understand the process of the mind, but I can assure you that it's not hallucinations and delusions you're having in the process of dying, okay? So yes, your soul will leave, you will so see those things, and there will be loved ones around so that you can be comfortable now in a new form. That's why the loved ones are there. I'm glad you said that because it's a confirmation for me. I've had so many near-death experience guests, and a lot of them have had traumatic endings, but almost every one of them left their body before the pain started. For example, oh, like as if, yeah. like, if they got hit by a car, they were out of their body just before the car hit them. Yes, and that's exactly what happens. And um, really, truly is good to know because think of, think of the history of humankind, right? And you can think of it, it's, it's this, I've gone through this in my head many, 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 many times because it, Part of me gets the compassion for humans when when I see that they have been through or can go through these types of things and experiences. So I still I still have to have the faith that that is all true, that we really jump out. So I can't say that it's 100 percent proof that this is what happens and I don't have to worry about it. You know, I don't want everybody thinking out there, oh, now I can go rob a bank and if I get shot in the head, I don't have to worry about it because my soul's gonna jump out of my body. No, okay. Um, we don't know 100% for sure that that's exactly what happens. And guess what? That's set up that way purposely because that's what faith and free will is all about. Choosing to believe what you want to believe. Now, you said earlier that your friend's problem and you dealing with your friend's problem was basically the catalyst that oh, yeah. set you off for all this mediumship. At any other point in your life, did you have a spiritually transformative awakening? Did you have an NDE? Did you have anything else? No, that was, no, the, the whole event that happened and my STE, the spiritual transformative event happened over a three month period. And it was so overwhelming as I expressed to you. Um, I would say that it would have only um, almost been easier if I was, you know, had a near death, I had a heart attack and then they revived me and all of that came to me in that way because it would have gone a lot quicker and I wouldn't have had to go through the process of proving to myself and my wife and my family members that we weren't crazy, um, this is real, and then why me and all of that and letting go of my, my career as a singer, actor, and dancer. And um, no, what I will say though, I created transformative events all along the way. I would like to share what I believe a near-death experience is for. It's a shaking of the shoulders. It's an intentional attempt to wake you up to the purpose you have chosen, but for some reason, you're not on that path. So even for me, I had to wait. Here I am being tormented in my youth. Here I am feeling like I'm a big piece of crap, but I'm a singer, actor, and dancer, and I'm gonna be famous. And that'll show everybody, that'll prove that I'm really worth it. And I still didn't wake up to anything. I literally had to have thrown in front of me somebody that I cared about so much who was hurting so deeply that I forgot about me. And I was thinking about him and that allowed the awakening to occur. So that was kind of like my shoulder shaking. And so once that happened, from that point on, I learned through all my research, I've been doing this work almost 40 years now, Jeff, through all my work, I know how to constantly create a transformative event. Hmm. And it's through what I put out into the universe. So. 
my direction. Show me what it is I am absolutely meant to do at this point. At this point, what am I supposed to do? And so all of a sudden, I will get an email. Okay, okay I'll, I'll, I'll give you an example, okay? So I was a hospice social worker. And I worked for a major organization who turned that turned into complete corporate. I'm talking about a major health organization that everybody in the world knows because they travel from all over the world to come to North Carolina to go to this institution, but I won't name it. Well, they even turned hospice care into a corporate business. I was no longer able to see and spend time with my patients. I just had to sign them up for hospice and move on. If they needed counseling, I had to refer them to a local agency. Well, that's not what a clinical social worker is supposed to do. And so I wanted out, but they paid a great salary. I wasn't an actor anymore. I didn't know how to make my psychicness and my mediumship into a full-time profession. Yes, I was doing it part-time, but remember, I never said that I wanted to be a full-time psychic to start with, but I was accepting it and I took in all this information and I was already sharing it with people, but on a part-time basis. I had two children. I was getting great benefits in this job, but I wanted out. And I asked, I went back to God, get me out of this business, this company, please, and set me on the path of where I'm supposed to be. Bam, I'm in a car accident. Now, I did not suffer anything major other than I did have some brainstem injury that caused me double vision, a bad double vision. I couldn't drive anymore. And I was on workers comp, so I couldn't go to work. And as a social worker here in North Carolina, and just in general, if you're going to do clinical work, you have to have a license so that you can drive and do outreach stuff. It's a requirement when you apply for a job. So the car accident completely took me out of social work altogether. And then one day, I'm on, the, on my email, and for the first time, I see from Hay House, Become a mover and shaker. Become a mover and shaker. And I read about it and I'm like, I, I want this. This is what I want to do. And that was the beginning of the rest of my career. And that was in 2008, which isn't that long ago. Okay. Yes, it's what it's, it's 16 years ago. No, um, my math is terrible right now. 14 years ago. Okay. 14 years ago. I was in that car accident and I see that email. And from that point on, all of a sudden, I was getting requests for more readings. More re I wasn't advertising a thing, but I learned how to become a mover and shaker. Then the next step happened. And then people were calling me and it was turning. I was going, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, I've, I've got four readings today. I've got, I've got 10 readings for the week. Holy cow, oh my gosh. And then all of a sudden people were asking me, would you like to speak at a summit that we're doing here in Raleigh? I said, you're kidding me. You want me to speak at this? I would love to speak at the summit there. And I was, again, I wasn't advertising a thing, but I said, okay, I'm a mover and shaker. And so the moment I did that and I proclaimed it, it transformed my entire life again and my career. And this turned into my full-time job. Now I could have avoided the accident, right? All I had to do Instead of saying, get me out, and I was the one, obviously, God did not send the girl to hit me from behind. Whatever you put out into the universe, make sure you direct it, the energy, because you don't have any idea how it's going to make happen what you put out there until you direct it. So I could have just said, show me what it is I'm supposed to do next. I would have gotten the same email without the car accident. And if I had taken the steps myself to leave, I wouldn't have had to get hurt in order to leave. So whichever way the universe and my soul being part of that was helping me, that would have been my next transformative event that I created. But now 
I know how to create them more without the accident part. I just say, give me the next step that I'm meant to do. And man, it's something major. And it's as if it's as if I just got an email directly from the universe. Boom, right? It just lands there. It talks to me constantly, Jeff. Constantly talks to me the moment I yes. So now the transformative events can happen almost every single day of my life. That was great. Thank you for sharing that. I need to change gears because I mentioned it in the beginning about the Galactic Council. Oh, yeah. So how did you start communicating with them? <laughs> Again, here I am in my office and I'm just doing some work and all of a sudden I hear my inner voice and what I hear is, we'd like to speak with you. And I'm looking around and I'm now at this point, I'm also communicating with animals. So my, I had no animals in the room. My dog wasn't in the room. My cat wasn't in the room. So I know, well, it wasn't them. So I looked at my ficus plant and was wondering, is that you? Are, are you now talking to me? Am I going to be a botanist? What? And, and I hear, no, 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 it's us. And then I'm going, okay, who is us? We're an intergalactic council, spiritual in spirit. And we would like to communicate with you. And I'm like, excuse me, you're what? Now, all of a sudden, I feel like I'm going through a Star Trek episode. Mm -hmm. And I wasn't a Trekkie. I'm more a Star Wars fan, but not a Trekkie fan, though I watched them. And they're telling me that they're literally deceased spirits from different universes that are now part of a major council to help all people who are incarnating and traveling interdimensional traveling to different universes, they kind of guide that. As a matter of fact, this is the group that stopped the extraterrestrials from visiting us when they did in the very beginning. And now all of a sudden, there was a point in our history where we no longer talked about sightings. And we know it was brief. It was just in certain countries and cultures where they did, you know, up in the Peru, Peruvian valleys in the mountains, right? In Peru, they had more sightings and because they were more accepting, but it was still hush hush. And that's because this council stopped them from coming to help us. Basically for the purpose of, you had a chance to grow yourself and evolve yourself. You have to let earth and humans evolve themselves and learn and grow. But then they started sneaking here. The point of their communication with me was because of all of these movies, because of War of the Worlds, all right, just because of that story and all the protection that the government is hiding, all of these aliens that are coming down from us, we have all this negative concept and connotation of aliens. We even believe there are people who believe there are malevolent aliens who will come down here and suck the brains out of our heads. Um, oh, well, that's also the reptilians. There also is a belief that there is a species of aliens who came and went into the water and are procreating with crocodiles. I, I think we're willing to believe anything, right? Right? And so, Albert Einstein himself said in order for, he believed in extraterrestrials and life forms outside of the universe, but he said in order for any of them to come to the earthly dimension, they would have to command spiritual concepts, spiritual concepts. They could never be malevolent because they would never then be on a spiritual, high spiritual level and know how to dematerialize and rematerialize or use a spiritual understanding of the law of attraction in the positive way to be able to interdimensionally travel, which is what they do. So they could only be here then for what reason? To help us. We are one of the slowest species in all the universes to evolve. And you can see that. You can look on the planet today and look, 
I am not, and I'm sorry, listeners, I know you all like listening to fluffy things that make you feel good. But you know what? Fluffy things don't always heal. They're Band-Aids. Band-Aids don't heal. You have to get to what's under the surface. You can have an infection and keep wrapping it in a Band-Aid. It doesn't go away unless you get medicine on that infection. And sometimes you have to rip off the Band-Aid or burst the blister to get down to the core. So yes, a lot of things that I say sound negative, but in actuality, it's the only way to get to the healing part, right? And so... Everybody wants to make everything touchy-feely, and it's not all touchy-feely. It's about we are way back. Jeff, we are still trying to get people to understand that women are equal, black people are equal, Muslims are equal, lesbians, gays, queers, bisexuals are all equal, we're still fighting that nonsense. And so we are not evolved. And if you look at what's going on on the planet, the planet is a proof of what's going on with us because we influence the planet changes, the storms. It's one catastrophe after another. If it isn't storms, it's fires. If it isn't fires, it's earthquakes. Now we've got volcanoes erupting again, and we've got tidal waves and tsunamis and all of this unbelievable stuff going on. And it's all around the time in a pandemic coming out that was out. And it all happened at the height of the negativity and the hatred and the, the shootings and the killings here and the anger and the resentments that's going on here. We're energies and we're putting out all this negative energy stuff, right? So what's happening is we are e even causing illnesses. As a hospice social worker, Jeff, I had a patient who died of cancer from under the pinky nail, pinky nail is where her cancer started. And she died from that at 42 years old. The most ridiculous diseases and illnesses, aneurysms left and right all over the place from kids, from adults, it doesn't matter. And so our alien brothers and sisters are trying to hasten our evolvement. They actually spliced our genes. They're the ones that helped to create modern man. If you read Greg Braden's book, Fractal Times, he'll talk about how over 11,000 years ago, there was an absolute change in the structure of human DNA. And it went from the Neanderthal DNA to modern man overnight, instantaneously, because it was spliced. Who did the splicing? They don't want to talk about that because that'll change all history and really blow people's minds. That's why they took drugs in the 60s so much because they wanted to experience all this stuff, but they needed to be on the drug while their mind was blowing up. Aliens did that. Our brothers and sisters from a higher dimension. We're basically human hybrids. And the proof of that, go have your DNA tested. Do it, Ancestry.com, 23andMe.com. They actually separate the lineage to the final point of where you could be coming from. Are you full modern man or do you have Neanderthal in you? And of course, because of my father's side of the family, it turns out I have some Neanderthal mm -hmm. in me. And if you met my father's side of the family, they used to throw meatballs at each other at a family dinner, okay? Neanderthals mm -hmm. for sure. Mm -hmm. And so... You're spliced, that DNA has a part of that. And it's the aliens that were doing that to try to hasten us. If we had to wait, that's why we've got our timing way off in modern man and when we started, you know, because to go from just Neanderthal to who we are now, we'd need millions and millions of years of existence. And that's not how long we are and how old we are, okay? So it was spliced. Well, they've been coming back. Why are they abducting people? Because we're creating diseases faster than our bodies can evolve to take care of them. We would not exist right now if there wasn't a hastening of a healing process, if they didn't change the genetics. So right now we're at the worst that we could be. And guess what? We're seeing them the most. 
mm. right? Haven't there been report upon report? So this intergalactic council have been talking to me because they know that I'm going to be out in the public, I'm going to be on shows like yours, and they want me to give the truth about who they are. And I've been introduced to some of the most famous people now in, in ufology and have unbelievable experiences with UFOs and aliens that, that and validating for each other our experiences. And so I know that we're getting as much help as possible and that's why the, the council started to communicate with me. And the one thing I found out about me once I got really involved in this, Jeff, is to believe what comes to me. Look, I don't know if I'm full of shit. I could be. You know, I'm an Italian New Yorker and an actor and arrogant. I could be making all of this up. All of us could be making this up, right? Any of our spiritual stuff, we could be making up. But you know what? The way I figure it when I'm talking to people, if it's helping you, if you're changing your life, if you're achieving your dreams because of anything that we're sharing, even if it sounds like bullshit, go for it because it's not harming you. And if all of this is bullshit, when you die, you won't even know. <laughs> yeah, that's a great point. Now, your new book that's coming out is called The Secret That's Holding You Back. And you have a radio show called Stop Stopping Yourself, which to me is basically the same thing. How are we stopping ourselves and or how are we holding ourselves back? And what can we do to stop doing that? Oh, my gosh, that is great. OK, so that's what my book is all about, the secret that's holding you back. Um, and the show is and unfortunately, since we've spoken, the Unity Network has shut down. So I, I don't even have that show anymore. But I do lectures and, and, and stuff based on Stop Stopping Yourself. Having studied psychology and done a lot of research for the past 40 years and my experience in this in the metaphysics and psychology and spiritual fields and the paranormal, all the information that I have gathered, the thousands of people that I have worked with, Jeff, I have come to understand that there are an anomalies that go on in the brain that actually get in the way of people manifesting what they want. That's the problem. In psychology, we actually help people develop their coping skills. If you come to me and you have anxiety and you have depression, I'm supposed to teach you some cognitive behavioral therapy tools to help you learn how to deal with that, to deal with some of the stresses that you're going through life with, to deal with the dysfunctional family members or that boss who is giving you a hard time. I'm going to help you deal with that and cope. Well, the reason why we used to teach people is to be able to get them through life because that's what we expect is what life is all about, is to get through it the way you want, hopefully. But that eliminates the spiritual aspect of who we are. There's a bigger problem than not achieving a dream or not being motivated to go after the right job. There's a bigger problem than that. The problem is that you could be creating everything you don't want without even knowing that that's what you're doing. And so everything that you do want, you're actually stopping yourself. For the most part, Jeff, most people don't believe what they think they believe. So in my book, I go through the understanding that there are different levels of the mind than once claimed. Sigmund Freud and other psychiatrists in his field and studies of the human mind described the human mind it started out as on two sections. If you recall the image of the iceberg, right, um, you would see that a very small portion of it is above the water and a larger per portion of the iceberg is below the water, right? And so that's basically the mind. Your conscious part is above the surface and the unconscious part is below the surface. So at that time, they only called it the subconscious mind. 
That's a big portion. It actually accounts for 95 to 98 percent of your entire mind is below the surface of your awareness. Well, when Sigmund Freud came along and studied it further, he divided it more into another couple of parts. Besides the conscious part, which is in your awareness, there's this subconscious part of the mind that he figured that's the part that does all the automatic stuff. What part makes your heart beat without you thinking about it? It's, it's, it's the mind part of the brain. What makes you be able to go and brush your teeth once you were taught how to do it without thinking about it? If we had to think about everything that we were supposed to do in, in physical activity or um, even emotional, we would never get anywhere in life, right? You know, just to get out of bed in the morning, you would have to, okay, I got to roll over now and I got to get my left foot and leg over the side of the bed, put it down, put my foot on the floor. No, you don't have to do that. You don't think about it anymore. It's because the subconscious mind takes over. Well, the subconscious mind also takes over automatic feelings and responses and your emotions based on what you've trained it. Beneath that layer is where Sigmund Freud did most of his positive work, and he distinguished an unconscious mind. The unconscious mind, he said, is where all the knowing is. Why do we know the difference between right and wrong? Why are there some things we understand automatically without having been trained to do it? And that's kind of the nature versus nurture Con, uh, a talk and theories too, that we come in with some information as well as a blank slate to create some new things for ourselves. Carl Jung was a student of Sigmund Freud and he went into the unconscious mind even further. And he said that that is the super conscious mind. And the reason why we know the difference between right or wrong, and all humans do, is because we're connected to a higher consciousness, a different mind or the mind of God. I took that even that much further and said, there are other divisions of the mind that occur once we incarnate here on the planet. You're coming from a positive, loving world and your soul actually resides, your soul's mind is the superconscious mind that Carl Jung was talking about. And your soul's mind is connected to source, spirit, and everything that's good. Now you come into this life and you start experiencing negative messages from your environment. And you start, because of that, forming your first set of self-beliefs based on those messages. And they're not positive, all of them. I call them the I'm not. I'm not good enough. I'm not smart enough. I'm not deserving enough. From all those corrections and the negative messages and negative attention that you receive, you're forming these answers. And so I say that the brain created another division that is, I call the environment made mind. I call it the environment made mind because when you're a kid, you're just absorbing everything. Right, you're absorbing everything, and your brain is just trying to say you're you, it, the only answer it can come up with. It must be me. It must be me. It must be me. So it's just forming all these first set of maladaptive beliefs, and it can't be in the same mind with the good beliefs because that's like oil and vinegar. So the brain creates another section, and that's what I call the environment made mind. Now, now you have the conscious, the subconscious the environment made mind, and then the unconscious mind. And so what's closer to your subconscious mind and your conscious mind are all those bad beliefs. Well, the two highest functions of the human brain is to keep us alive and to protect us in order to keep us alive. Well, we know how it protects us, Jeff, physically. For example, the coronavirus, one of the symptoms was a fever. Well, the coronavirus didn't cause the fever, the brain does. And anytime you have a virus or a bacterial infection, your brain will raise intentionally your body temperature to make it an unlivable environment for the bacteria. It's not necessarily paying attention to the fact that the temperature is uncomfortable. And if it goes too high, it could even kill you. Its primary goal, get rid of the bacteria or the virus. Okay, well, it also protects us emotionally. So now you're walking around with all these bad feelings. I'm not good enough. I'm not lovable. And the brain doesn't like that. So it creates 
a new division of the mind that I call the adult made mind, because as your brain starts to develop, you start to develop those defense mechanisms that Freud talked about. You know, suppression, repression, sublimination, projection, all of that stuff. Well, that's now in that portion of the mind that shields you and protects you from the maladaptive beliefs. So now you got the conscious mind, the subconscious mind, the adult made mind, the environment made mind, and then your unconscious mind where the soul is all the way down here trying to get the messages up about how good you are. But the adult made mind doesn't trust anything that's coming from below. And it will create whatever beliefs you need to feel good about yourself to cover up the bad feelings. So, for example, instead of believing I'm not good enough, that's why I'm not going to get a promotion at work, you'll believe what a jerk my boss is. Oh, definitely. He's the reason. Or all my other, oh, my God, they're all butt kisses over there. That's why they got a promotion. That feels so much better than I suck. And that's why I'm not getting a promotion or a raise. We don't like those feelings. Or I'm out. Oh, my, my partner is a bum. That's why my relationship broke up. I'm with the wrong person. They're abusive. They're this, they're that. The government, that's the reason why I'm suffering. The economy, I have no money because of the economy. My neighbor, he's terrible. What a moron he is. Or we do behavioral things like start drinking or taking drugs to, to totally shield us and to distract us from those painful feelings. But again, that's all psychological. Plug that all in the wall and let's go back to the concept of the law of attraction. The law of attraction is connected to every human in their unconscious mind below the surface. So what is below the surface, the closest to that connection? The environment made mind and the beliefs that you've got harbored in there. So when you're going to apply for a job that you think you want, you believe you deserve it. You believe in your adult made mind that you are good enough for it. But that kid inside deep down is telling you, no, you're not, you're not good enough. You're not going to get that job. And because that's what's plugged into the wall, that's what you're manifesting. And because you don't believe you're lovable because you didn't weren't raised being nurtured into knowing that, and you're going out to have a partner and attract a partner, and you're putting that energy out. I want a partner. I want to have a family. I'm going to get a real good, my knight in shining armor, my princess. And then you attract somebody that in a couple of months, it doesn't work even in a year or so, because deep down that little kid inside of you is saying, you're not lovable. You're not good enough. So we get in our own way and stop ourselves because we don't understand that the set of beliefs that we think we're functioning from are the fake set of beliefs. The placebo effect works really well. And we can convince ourselves we believe anything. And some people can get even far with their adult made mind fake set of beliefs, but they eventually fall apart as all fake beliefs fall apart. And they end up not completely achieving what they want, failing or everything falling apart, the other shoe dropping. We even make phrases like that, the other shoe dropping to make up for it. That's a defense mechanism. Oh, I know, because that's life. I'm not meant to be happy because the last time I was happy, that fell apart. And I know that this is really going well. So something has got to happen. That's because we're creating from the fake set of beliefs. And of course, they fall apart. So I teach people, and all of that is in here, how to get to the true part of what you're believing so you can change those beliefs and heal. I worked with somebody today and I made her turn around and say, I need you to say out loud to yourself, I'm not lovable, I'm not good enough, I have no worth, and therefore it's not worth me getting any success in my life. I made her say that out loud and I said, how did that sound? And she said, that's the most ridiculous thing I've ever said. And I said, but do you understand that that's what you've been, been believing all your life? And then you're wondering why you're holding yourself back and not going after your dream jobs. And you're only doing the practical job because that's what you were told to do. How do you bypass that? 
So this is why I put the work in, because I don't care what you do. You can read all the books you want. You can follow all of the concepts and the ancient world wisdom on how to manifest, how to change your life. But if you don't do that inner work, it's not going to work. It works briefly. It falls apart. Or or, or you get totally disillusioned in it and think that this is all BS. And it's not. It's because you're stopping yourself because you don't believe what you think you believe. You use the word work. Does it take a lot of work to be able to bypass that and, and connect with what you really Absolutely. want? Absolutely. Hmm. Here's the interesting thing. The process is very simple. And you'll see that I give some, I give all these different exercises and steps to do it. And they're such simple processes. But the practice is the difficult work part because every single day of your life, think of those levels that I talked about. Think of the subconscious mind and what's been training the subconscious mind. All the stuff in the 95 to 98% that's in unawareness. And that subconscious mind, and however old you are, you've been going through that year after year after year after year. I told you my past and I was tormented. And I told you and you know now of my successes and even further that I'm going. But every day of my life, I have to be aware of little Vinny in there. Little Vinny, even till today, wants to say, you're not good enough. You're not going to go far. Your book isn't going to do anything. You're, you're, I don't care how many shows you're going to be on. This, you're not going to amount to anything. Because little Vinny, the human part of me, was damaged. He's scarred. I've taken care of my issues, but the scars are still there. And I have to be on top of him. Yes, it's work, but let me tell you something, Jeff. It's the most profound work you will ever, ever do. And when you get to the other side of that initial work, me being in touch with little Vinny all the time isn't the hard part. The hard part was me admitting that I had to do that, admitting that I had a defense mechanism. That's the hardest part. Then getting down and being in touch with that little kid inside of me, I actually felt very compassionate for him. So yes, it's a practice that I do on a daily basis, but that initial work, I don't care. You can be a CEO of a company easier, but this is the reason why we keep coming back lifetime after lifetime is to find our divinity and our magnificence and our true power and value. And yes, if we were afraid of work, we wouldn't be here so many times. And there wouldn't be one dream that was ever accomplished. So do you feel like you've gotten to the point now where you're not coming back next time? You're going somewhere else and doing something else? Are you kidding me? <laughs> you think you have to ask that question at this point? <laughs> Uh, no, I'm not coming back. <laughs> and I've got a secret to tell you another one, but I'll say it out loud. <clears throat> I was spiritually told, and I kind of knew this, we are taking too long here. We, have, we were not supposed to incarnate on this earth this many times. And what's actually happening to us, what you're seeing, are people imploding. Think about being an unlimited power and every time you come down into earth form, you're packing that power away, not to be able to use it all, to tap into it a little bit, but to constantly compress it while you're in an earthly experience. So your unlimited, unbelievable power, because we were created in its image, its form, we're part of everything too, and packing that in like you're creating an atom bomb. What happened to the atom when they packed all this pressure against it, it exploded. So what you're seeing in the way people are acting today is we're imploding and exploding all over each other. And so, no, I'm not going to come back. And I'm going to try to convince as many of my brothers and sisters here on this planet that you don't have to come back either anymore. The book of Revelation actually says that. It actually says and that's just so that you know, the book of Revelation is a personal experience, not a global experience. Even though we affect the globe, 
it's actually a personal and the seven seals that get broken open are your seven chakras, your seven spiritual centers that you will eventually open, letting all of the garbage out that you've packed within you, which is why it's all of that symbolic, it's totally symbolic. But in it, it's God that says, eventually my children will overcome the earth. And what it meant by that is eventually you won't need to incarnate down there anymore because you'll remember who you are. And then we can evolve and grow from here. There's more growing. Life isn't over just because we're not here. Okay. It actually gets really good, but because we still like to taste the pizza, we keep coming back thinking that that's part of the really good stuff when in actuality, it's not because you keep eating too much pizza. What happens? Your heart clogs and you die of a heart attack. So how good can it be even though it tastes really good? So there's got to be stuff and there is stuff that tastes so much better and it's good for you at the same time and it's not broccoli. Vincent, I've gone way past my normal time. <laughs> no, and, I've gone way past your questions. And no, and, and it has been great and I hope you come back and join us again. But before we get going, where can we get your book? Is it on your website or on Amazon or where? Oh, Amazon, Amazon. If you go to my website at vincentgenda.com, there is a link there, but actually just go to amazon.com, your own Amazon. And truly in here, here's the thing that's really important that we need to understand. There's a lot of very powerful information that everybody needs to read in this. And even in pre-orders, it, it launches June 21st. But the more you pre-order a book on Amazon, especially in this day and age, it puts it out into the world. The other marketers actually look at the ratings on Amazon and they decide, that's how they decide to get it out there. And we're trying to get it worldwide. My publisher is worldwide. And so, yes, if you can pre-order it, not only are you doing yourself the greatest favor of all, but you're also helping others because they really do need to read this. It's just a simple book. It really is. But it has unbelievable prophetic information in it that will transform your life and it will not hold you back anymore. It will definitely help you to become unstoppable. Besides the book, do you have anything else that you've got going on that you want us to know about? Uh, yeah, actually, I do. Um, we're doing since the Unity Radio Show and Network had stopped. Um, I am and several of us hosts have been moved over to a podcast platform and it's going to also be on a YouTube channel. So we'll be recording just like this. And so you can get the podcast of it everywhere. And the platform is mindbodyspirit.fm. And on my, the name of my show, I changed the name of my show, show Jeff. It's going to incorporate stuff stopping yourself but it's now called the jenna effect hmm. like that it's the jenna effect on mind body spirit fm it has all of my old podcasts from all of the radio shows that i did on unity and there's so many fabulous hosts on there that are coming over suzanne giesman all of them and so you you really want to go after the information and do the work for yourself and that's how you make changes and transform your life do the work all right, well, before we finish up, can you leave us with one last positive message? Yes. The positive message is you're the greatest gift that you've ever been given. And you are the one that cre can create all that you want. You deserve to believe in yourself, but everything starts with that self-belief. I believe that life will change and transform and that all of this is an illusion. We just want to stop the suffering and we can do that, but just don't let life catch you up in depression and thinking that this is all there is. It isn't. If you step back from the picture, you'll wind up seeing that this is just scraping the surface of who you really are. This is all like a living matrix, really. And you are part of a greater picture and never think that you are unvaluable. Because if you were to take life right now and turn it, make a picture and turn it into a puzzle, no matter how many pieces, every single piece of that puzzle is vital to the picture. And did you ever do a 2000 piece puzzle and at the very end you were missing one small, tiny little piece? It's so friggin' annoying. Mm -hmm. You 
even though we're all small pieces because there's so many of us, you're part of a most important big picture and you complete it. That's how valuable you are. So just keep going and don't ever give up and go after your dreams because that's how you truly get to experience yourself. Thank you so much, Jeff, for letting me share that. Thank you, Vincent, for being my guest. I really appreciate you and have a great rest of your day. You too. Thanks for watching the Jeff Mara podcast. I really appreciate you. Another way to show support is through YouTube memberships. And if you do, there are loyalty badges and other perks depending on your level of membership. All you need to do is click the join button underneath the video to find out more. Thank you for your support. Thanks for watching the Jeff Mara podcast. I really appreciate you. Another way to show support is through YouTube memberships. And if you do, there are loyalty badges and other perks depending on your level of membership. All you need to do is click the join button underneath the video to find out more. Thank you for your support.